Let's bring in David Bonson, founder and CIO of the Bonson Group, as we break down these markets on a day where, as we said, we're under a little bit of pressure, but the golf stops with up arrows. Did you watch... Uh, the Masters yesterday? Every single minute of it. Me too. As, as President Trump was tweeting, yeah. we know he was watching as well. What would you think? Pretty exciting, right? Pretty exciting, yes. <laughs> so let's get to the markets, David, because we're so happy that you're here. So let's start off with what you're thinking on the markets in the broad base, right? So we're in mid-April now. We've had a nice run thus far. Where, what is your thoughts? Well, I mean, we definitely are more expensive than we were, obviously, at those December troughs, but we're not more expensive than we were in January of 2018. And in fact, earnings are 25% higher than they were at that point. So we have earnings are 25% higher and a valuation that is somewhat lower. But the question is really all about the future. Markets are always and forever a discounting mechanism. And I think that markets right now need to get certainty around the China trade deal, which I'm very optimistic optimistic about. And we have to see that business confidence, business investment come back. It evaporated in the second half of last year. It had been absolutely rallying through the first year and a half of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. CapEx, business investment leading to productivity. That's the question mark for markets. So, yeah, so you make a really interesting point, like some great earnings, valuations are decent, but you got to see uh, what ha- happens ahead. Um, one of the things that you were talking about when I was reading through your notes, you were talking about dividends and that being such a key point as well, right? Yeah, I mean, in our Strategy. case, the, the way that we manage client capital is always and forever dividend driven, dividend growth driven. So whether we were talking about a very bearish environment or more bullish one, we um, believe that dividend growth represents the the uh, kind of criteria we want for the companies we're buying in any market season. I would argue it's probably more potent than normal now um, for the simple reason that interest rates are not only low, but we've seen that they're not going to be able to get much higher. There isn't any precedent for a society that gets addicted to low interest rates getting off of that addiction. But fundamentally, this is really the important thing, Nicole. I think that dividend growth tells you what management thinks about their own prospects. J.P. Morgan released earnings on Friday. They had grown the dividend 40% in the third quarter last year. They come out when everyone's talking about it was a weak quarter, it was slow, the yield curve is so flat. They crushed it. I think that J.P. Morgan is a great example of a company using their dividend to indicate how well they believe things are going. Yeah, that was a real surprise to Wall Street and set the tone, really, because we saw PNC do well as well. And today we've had a mixed bag, ultimately, when you break it down. Um, As we talk about these dividends, we showed some of your top holdings, Enterprise, Blackstone, Procter & Gamble. So these are the dividends, some of the dividend opportunities that we talk about. And you also talk about just accumulating dividend, when not to withdraw. People get really nervous or the strategy, they get shaky on a, you know, a pullback. Yeah. Uh, what is your strategy with all that? So you, you bring up two different points there, both of which are just excellent. It almost sounds like you've read the book already because the dividend accumulation is where you really are benefiting from a bad market. Companies like Procter Gamble, McDonald's, Enterprise, they're paying you those dividends regardless of what the share price is doing, and more importantly, they're growing the dividends. Let's see, McDonald's and Procter Gamble just happen to be examples. 30 years ago, uh, the stock price was equal to what their annual dividend is right now. Okay, so an investor is getting 100% yield on what they paid for the stock year after year after year because those dividends having been reinvested through that time period. Enterprise products, a very similar story, even more uh, uh, aggressive with the dividend growth. Uh, Blackstone is a company that is structured differently from a tax standpoint. They're an LP. They are pay- they have to pay out the vast majority of their operating earnings. They don't keep a lot of assets on their balance sheet, and yet they give us a high current yield, roughly about eight percent per year. Uh, the company's grown five hundred percent since they went public, and yet the stock is still at a similar range as it was then because they're distributing all that money to us. We love all those stories. We think they're both defensive and a great way to make money. And then to your other point. We Withdrawers can withdraw without worrying about what the share prices are doing in the market. So these would all be picks of yours, right? I mean, we own all of them. JP Morgan, BBT, right? BBT um, is one that we saw also that you had on your list. Um, I want to talk about your book at the same time, tout that you're Barron's part of Barron's top 100 advisors for 2018, Forbes top wealth advisors. You have the Financial Times top advisor. So tell us the name of your book. I know it just came out. 
Yes, I brought it to give you a copy here today, oh, but it is you. just came out last week. It is called The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post-Crisis World. You know, we've gone 10 years since the financial crisis now, and I think that uh, until last year where we dipped just a little bit, we hadn't had a negative year. You went through three rounds of quantitative easing. You just have had an incredibly good market for 10 years. I happen to believe the market very potentially has more innings left in it. But the fact of the matter is that we know markets go up and down, and you had two decades now that are really ahistorical. The first decade of the new century, where no, no one made any money for 10 years, starting with the dot-com crash and ending with the financial crisis, and then this next decade that has been this kind of V-shaped recovery. In a general sense, markets are cyclical, and their stock prices are going to go up and down through time, and a withdrawer has to kind of deal with that in their cash flow. Let's say a retiree, for example. Dividend growth gives you ability to be insulated from that, but most importantly, we believe it represents a higher quality company. Yes, we're going to miss out on some really great stories that aren't ready yet to be paying a dividend. We'll live with that, but we avoid a lot more terrible stories with the strategy. That's what the book's about. I mean, it's a lot like dollar cost averaging, where people are trying to put money in each quarter quarter or each week. Well, it's quite literally dollar cost average. Yeah, the, right. Because basically you're, you're, I would be buying another stock, I'm saying, that would not be a dividend type stock. But now I'm getting back every you know, term, every quarter I'm getting the dividend right. payout. And then, you know, ideally you just want to sort of reinvest those dividends or if you're going to withdraw, maybe just withdraw from the gains, right? Well, no, or withdraw from the positive dividend itself, meaning if you're in a withdrawal phase, you can let the share prices vacillate, but if the income is enough to support your lifestyle, mm -hmm. you can be withdrawing this not only positive, the dividend can't go negative, right. right? You're always getting that positive aspect of your return, and in this strategy, it's always growing. The, the portfolio would have kicked off more cash in 2008 than it did in 2007, despite the fact that the underlying stock market had gotten pummeled. So what is your overall big picture then? So if you feel like there's still more innings, you said, right? That was your phrase. Yeah. Um, so there's still more room to the upside. People should keep investing or reinvesting? Well, certainly. I mean, you never want to disrupt uh, a, f a carefully constructed investment plan if your goals haven't changed just based on what you think the market may do one, a quarter here, a quarter there. And it sounds somewhat cliche, but it is cliche for a reason. It's a timeless principle. But I will say this, from a more tactical standpoint, um, the, the comment I made earlier is very important about CapEx and business investment. Right. I, I think that you're going to end up getting to a point where what the Fed inevitably has to do to take, pull some liquidity out that they've now kind of gone under pause with, at some point that affects markets. At some point you have a business cycle recession. I don't expect another 2008, but even though I don't believe the recession is going to be in the next 18 months, I certainly believe there's going to be another one. Right. And the fact of the matter is that there are high quality companies that are much more non-cyclical, that provide better defense to a period like that. I think now is a good time to be positioning around quality and holding those companies that represent a bit more defensive play. Is there still growth ahead? Yes, but we have to watch that business investment. What will happen is capital expenditures will pick up. They were the missing ingredient through the entire Obama right. presidency. Yeah. If the CapEx picks up, you get greater productivity and it drives growth, and that's what we need in this economy. All right. Well, thank you so much, and good luck on your new book, The Case for Dividend Growth, Investing in a Post- crisis world. David Vonson, founder and CIO of the Vonson Group. Thanks so much. Thank you.